you for giving me this opportunity to share uh, some of our past history and present life of our, of our parish. Our parish is unique in the sense that it's the only uh, church community founded in America by uh, St. John of Shanghai in San Francisco. As everyone knows, uh, he came here from the Philippines, from Tubabao, <clears throat> to intercede on behalf of uh, thousands of his flock that, that were stranded on the island of Tubabao for about two and a half, three years. And he was successful in lobbying Congress and um, those poor people who were living in terrible conditions in the jungles of the Philippines. 1949, right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, were able to leave for America, Australia, South America and uh, to, for better lives. So Wadika was here for several months lobbying Congress and in that time he gathered a group of um, <clears throat> Russian Orthodox Christians who were faithful to the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia and to Vladika personally. They had veneration for him. <coughs> and he served the first liturgy on the Feast of the Beheading of St. John the Baptist. So um, our church celebrates its um, feast day on that very fateful day, which became fateful in this country in 2001 when uh, terrorist attacks occurred on Washington and New York. <coughs> uh, so our patron saint is St. John the Baptist, and we consider St. John of Shanghai and San Francisco to be our second patron saint, because he's our founder. We have a sculpture there um, dedicated to Vladika Yan, and of course a beautiful mosaic of St. John the Baptist, uh, executed in a wonderful Byzantine style by a very prominent Russian uh, iconographer, Alexander Sokolov, who passed away three years ago in Moscow. Our church is built in the uh, Moscow Yaroslav um, style. It's, it's, a, it's a combination. And the architect was uh, uh, Bishop Daniel Alexander of Erie. He was an old believer bishop and uh, a blessed memory. <clears throat> he did a wonderful job because he had to take the existing structure, uh, which was intended in the future to become a two story church. The bottom floor was to be act as a hall and the church on the second floor. And uh, Archbishop Nikon of Washington, Florida, of blessed memory, didn't like the style of that particular church. And he said, no, no, in Washington, we have to build a exemplary church that exemplifies the best in Russian church architecture. So he gave the uh, project to Bishop Daniel and you can see he did a magnificent job. Here we are in the corner of 17th and Shepherd Street in Washington DC. We're about uh, three miles north of the White House and uh, in the middle of it all. Uh, of course, had I had my say, I would have built the church outside of DC, near the Beltway, uh, because we have very little Parking and space. And we have very little parking space, we have very little space to expand, but we do our best. We bought a house in the back just uh, about three years ago. Uh, our next the house that was next door to the church and, and we turned it into a, um, <coughs> a, a useful house for the, for the parish mm -hmm. needs. And of course this was built in, back in uh, 1958 as well, the rectory. Of, uh, former priest used to live there, but now it's the church hall and the library and the offices, classrooms. Uh, so we're doing our best. Uh, St. John is, uh, of course, the uh, founder of our church community in Washington, D.C. I will take this icon off. This is yours. Um, and this is truly a unique icon, uh, not only because it has a piece of his relic and uh, this black frame is his cassock of Olika John's, which he wore. Uh, and he's holding, of course, a model of our church in his hand, uh, being the founder. But this icon is unique uh, because it shows his life from birth to death in, in Seattle, Washington. 
where he died in the presence of the Kursk root icon of the Mother of God, which he venerated all his life, from his childhood until the very last day of his life. And uh, here you have probably uh, the only uh, icon uh, with an illustration of the Capitol building uh, in Washington, D.C. Of course, this is done to remind us that in 1949, uh, Ludwig John came to Washington uh, to lobby Congress on behalf of his uh, beloved flock that was stranded on the island of Tupabao in, uh, uh, in, in the Philippines. So this is St. John, and of course he's a, a beloved founder of our parish and the beloved hierarch of the entire Russian church now. Thank God, uh, since 2007, his uh, veneration for St. John has grown and spread in, in Russia like wildfire. This icon of St. Seraphim, of course, was painted by uh, the uh, painter uh, Popkov. And uh, it's a very powerful icon because the, the, the Saint Seraphim's figure is so large and mm -hmm. it's, it just pulls you towards it. Right. Well, people love this icon. Father Victor, how, okay, you, you take many things for granted. So you are a Russian Orthodox born and this is part of you, uh, of your identity. So how an American person who comes here how will this person feel? Would this person blend in in this congregation? Because it's my feel that it's very strongly Russian. One has to be Russian in order to belong. Is this the case here? No, not at all. We have uh, we recognized a long time ago that uh, we cannot live in isolation. We cannot be turned into a Russian ghetto. Uh, some people would like that, but uh, that's something that we as pastors have to resist with all of our being. Because uh, that's not the future of the church, and that's not the character of the church. The church is for everyone. And um, that's why in this parish, for, for decades now, we do everything two languages. We publish our monthly magazine in both languages, okay. in Russian and in English. It's very time-consuming to do that. Right. I mean, it's easier to put something together in your language that you know, and, and that's, that's it but to translate everything into, into English. At the Russian services that we have, um, we still have people who don't speak Russian, who like, to, like Church Slavonic. They like Church Slavonic, and they come. Um, so what do we do with the sermon? Well, we have people put on earphones, and we have a professional translator who translates into English. But, of course, that's for those few who insist on going to the Slavonic service and don't understand uh, Slavonic or Russian. But for a long time now, we have uh, we do parallel ser services. For a long time we served uh, two vigils every Saturday, at 4 o'clock in English and at 6.30 in, in Slavonic. Uh, every Sunday at 8 o'clock in the morning an English liturgy is served and uh, a church Slavonic one following it. Uh, not this, not too long ago, several months ago, we decided that we would do away with the um, separate English vigil service on Saturdays and just do bilingual, one bilingual service at five o'clock in the evening. Uh, this was done to underscore the fact that uh, both the English language speakers and the Russian language speakers of this parish represent one parish, one community. So there is no segregation? No. We're together, and the service is 50-50. We have two choirs who stand in the balcony up there, and uh, they alternate every week the, uh, the uh, permanent uh, hymns. Uh, and then we do the readings half in Russian, half in English. So I would assume that, that, that the meetings or your parish council are conducted in English. In English, right. Okay. We used to conduct them in Russian, but again, it just left our English language members lost. Uh, and in the translation, you know, when, you, when you're talking uh, regular business and discussing mm -hmm. difficult issue that we have to decide, it, we just decided that we would do it in English. How do people contribute? Well, for uh, members, right. people who are full-fledged members, uh, we have parish dues, uh -huh. uh, $35 a month, which is very little. 
uh, for we're working folks, uh, for students and uh, 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 pensioners, it's fifteen dollars a month. But of course, you're not going to build all this <laughs> on that such small amounts of money. So what we we have Christmas. Uh, campaign where we mail out our parish calendar with a, an appeal from me. That, that brings in good money. We have uh, uh, other campaigns. We have collections every Sunday. Um, and people, people understand that, you know, the church needs money to survive. And they're very generous. That's very important. That's very generous. And uh, we don't have tithing. Uh, because that's that's very hard for uh, Russians and Orthodox in general, I think, to grasp the idea of tithing, giving ten percent of your whatever, whatever you own to the church. Uh, but we still manage. I mean, I, uh, the candle sales, of course, and uh, uh, we have a, a bookstore, um, and uh, the sisterhood collects money for the church. We we do a, a big Russian festival. Every every year, two day festival, in which the whole community comes together, and we invite, we open the church up to everyone, to our neighbors, to our American friends. We do tours of the church. We sell Russian ethnic uh, um, food, and uh, that's a big money maker. Uh, we'll, uh, last year we made we, we grossed one hundred one thousand uh, dollars, which I think. Uh, it was after all the expenses we we made about seventy five. Uh, every month we report in the parish bulletin uh, all of, about all the major campaigns that we uh, have conducted in the course of the previous month. Because I want my parishioners to know that uh, this money uh, is not being collected and just disappears someplace, but it's it's uh, it's actually held. Uh, all of our sermons are are um, recorded. At every every service, both in English and Russian. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we tra trans we trans uh, we uh, uh, all of our services are uh, aired on on the internet. And you are probably getting uh, viewers from very unusual places, well, very remote places, right? Yes, of course. Uh, and you know, last Friday we did royal hours. We had about ten people in church, and over fifty watched. <laughs> <laughs> That's new reality. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. And there, I tell you, there, it's people love the services. Uh, my daughter has a special needs child, and she can't come to church very often. Senior, yeah. Senior, because she makes noise and gets in the way. But she loves to watch the service on a, on a large television. And uh, my daughter says that this is it's the best babysitter she, she could find. But we have uh, elderly people who can make it to church also on a regular basis and their children have taught them how to watch the services on Sundays and uh, they really feel, because it's live, we're, we're broadcasting them live, uh, they're not recordings, so um, people really get into it too. So that's, uh, I think it's a wonderful service and I want to use the, uh, we have, I want to thank those people who are responsible for this in our parish. We have four cameras in the church. And uh, before we used to um, broadcast only the major services, Sunday services, but now we just broadcast everything. How, how, how large is your uh, congregation? How do you think? Well, uh, uh, officially we have like 300 parishioners, but unofficially, in reality, like five, 500 give or take more. You mean, you mean uh, they, they more or less show up uh, on a regular basis. Or regular basis. Yeah. It just uh, some of the regulars uh, never uh, don't understand why they need to to register as parishioners, particularly among the newly arrived new arrivals. But gradually they come around, and uh, uh, as occasionally I remind them that this is a good thing to officially belong. Although it's it's a legalistic thing, if you will, but it's also a way of proving that you are dedicated to the church. We often hear, I think this word may be a little bit abuse of a family, so people like to call their uh, their community family, but in case of your parish, that rings uh, sort of more truer, because people can expect that in, in, in case of hardships, 
they know that this indeed their family because they can relate on help, not just spiritual help, but also little signs of help sometimes uh, means a lot. It's a great encouragement for people. So, and I understand that also here uh, there there are cases when people are in hell uh, and people know that they can relate on on, yeah. on, on you. Well, you know, uh, over the course of forty years, uh, I've met tens of thousands of people, literally. And uh, many of these people sought some kind of assistance. And uh, like, occasionally I come across them again and they say, oh, thank you so much. Back in 1983, you helped me so much with this or that. And I said, I don't, I don't remember, <laughs> frankly. There's just so many uh, cases. And, uh, but it is, we feel like uh, it is a family. I was sitting yesterday after liturgy in the hall, and we had a full hall was full of people with uh, celebrating, having uh, breaking the fast for the first time, and uh, I this just this feeling came over me that this is my family. These are beloved people. You know, these are people I see on a regular basis. Uh, I see them more often than my children <laughs> sometimes. You know, but they're uh, really it's it's we're very close knit, and the clergy we have four priests. Uh, four deacons, a uh, number of sub-deacons, and uh, they, everybody has their role. Everybody takes their role very seriously, and, uh, and they, they, they exercise their, their responsibilities very um, um, well with wisdom and, and understanding and love, and that's wonderful. Thank you, Father Victor, for your time, and I, I, I would like to wish from the bottom of my heart many, many more years for your ministry.